All right. Hey, good morning, Eric. Good morning, Mark. How are you, I'm, sir? I'm okay for an old fart. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> That's good, man. So, you look dapper today. Oh, thanks. Well, you do, too. Oh, thank you. You got that good haircut. You got mm-hmm. the, the beard coming back, the winter beard. Winter beard. Yeah, you got to do that. Get rid of the little stissity sash. Yeah, you know, doesn't it kill you guys? I mean, I hate to sound like this. Oh, God. But I saw I saw some guy on, uh, I, I tell you what, I was watching an interview with Al Pacino. Uh, he's, and he's, he's, he's awesome. He is, but his beard looks terrible. Does it? And I said to my wife, I'm like, I can't believe Al Pacino's got such a wispy beard. I go, look at mine. It grows in perfectly consistently. It is. It is beautiful. She goes, trying to compare yourself to Al Al Pacino, right? (laughs) (laughs) And then you stop talking, didn't you? (laughs) you, You got the same consistency, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and the good thing about you, too, is like you don't let it grow on your neck. No, that's that's, Doesn't that drive you crazy? It's dirty. What, the, what is it with the young guys that let it grow down their yeah, neck? You're not like supposed that? to do that, man. That's not right. <laughs> it's not that hard, dude. Yeah, man. You know, I could do it blindfolded. Yeah, yeah. It's super fast, super yeah, easy. It just, and it looks clean. You look tight, look put together. Yeah, exactly. But if it's growing oh, down here, that's like the that's when you're in the deer woods or something. Man. Yeah. You know, I mean you're yeah, out, been out, out there the, for a week. Yeah. yeah. That's that's acceptable. Yeah. I mean, I nobody wants to see like a man walking out of a river. Clean shaven. You no, know, that doesn't that make any sense. That isn't right. <laughs> you know. But but anyway, uh, so here we are. It's another episode of Big, Big Talk, Talk About Small Businesses. <laughs> it's good to be here with you, man. You too, brother. You know? This is actually, you know, one of my my stress relieving times of the week. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny, like, I mean, we're, I don't know about you, but like, I'm busy, you know, like on Wednesday, I'm like, man, crap, I got to do oh. this damn podcast with Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But then I, but <laughs> I got to drive all the way up here to you, Rogers. Man, you do have to, you, you do know, have to I mean, sacrifice your time. Haul. It is, it is. And not, I'm just like two, literally two minutes down the road, you know, but, uh, but man, when I'm getting, when I'm here though, man, I'm always happy. Yeah, and you know, I leave these things and I always feel good. Yeah. I think we're just getting energized. Getting crap out of us, maybe. Yeah. Emptying and out a little bit. It's like going to see your your shrink or something. <laughs> That's right? right. This is counseling for us. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true. There's like some some meetings. I used to, you know, I've been on a lot of boards of companies. Yeah. And whenever I would find myself on one where I'd go to the meeting and then I'd leave and it would take me like three days to recover mm. from the energy that was sucked out of me. Those are the ones I resigned from. Mm. And there's some some meetings or some people that just basically drain your energy. Yeah, no, that's true. And then there's some that that give it boost it up. That's yeah. the way I always feel about you. Thanks, man. You too, you know? bro. Yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, I think that the goal here is is to have as many meetings that boost you up. You actually have to be really careful about that in entrepreneurship. Well, because you can get drugged down into a lot of crap. Man. It's so true. I saw some quote the other day. Um, I can't remember what it was, it, it, other than the last sentence was that the the entrepreneur has to be an optimist. Okay, the mm-hmm. the most successful people in business are optimists. You mm-hmm. wouldn't be in it if you weren't. No. And so you got to keep your attitude good because when it goes downhill, man, it's, it hurts. It's it so hurts important. Everything. Really it's does. so important. And I mean, I think that that, in all honesty, like I've, I've been kind of, at least on my, I guess my second ride in entrepreneur. Well, I mean, that's not really true, but whatever phase I'm in right now. I get it. Well, I'm the same yeah. as you. I yeah, might I say that too, but it's like, yeah, there's like the so 30th. many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also forget about the ones that fail, you know? <laughs> well, there's ones, that, the thing is, there's ones you like throw your whole heart and soul yeah. into. And yeah. then there's other ones that are just like, you know, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try that. Yeah. And those usually aren't the ones that are the most successful. No. The no. ones you really throw yourself into are the ones that have the real. Well, yeah, because it takes everything you have. Yeah, you got to be the one that's getting up and getting at it, you know, yeah. keeping vision alive. But I mean, what I've been appreciating more lately is like how I hired and, you know, the team. Yeah. A long time ago was way, way, way different than what I do now. Yeah. I mean, literally my number one qualification. Mm-hmm is 
can I, I mean, does this person have a good attitude? Is this the kind of person that I want to like spend my time with? It's like so literally, true. it's almost like picking out like your it's like your friendships or something. And, you know? I agree with you 100 percent. And people who want to ignore that are crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I can say. I mean, we, we think that it's all about this. You know, they have to be smarter. I mean, which, you know, there's there's some or things particular background. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. But you mean, really, you just I mean, can you tolerate? Can they can you lift each other up? Yes. And keep the energy going. Yeah. And I've been on a rampage lately at the office, man. Been, yeah, dude. I've been well, like about, about about toxicity mm-hmm. and 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 gossip. That's like the song. You remember a system of a down, the Yeah. The toxicity <laughs> of the city. <laughs> I can't believe you know that song. Dude, that is such cool <laughs> points for you, bro. <laughs> Whenever I hear that though, I, that's what I think of. Toxic work. Mark freaking Zwag knows toxicity by system of the down. Dude, that's freaking, that's some massive cool points for oh, you, bro. Well, I had young daughters, okay? Okay, so that's true. They kept, and they kept me cool, so. But I mean, like, you know, my thing lately has been, like, just because I've seen it, like, d- develop over time when there's, like, little bickering, you know, there's, there's folks that, like, one individual within a team can start can have this opinion about something that was said or something that's being done or not being done or should be done. Right. And and you can see those people like they'll they're discontent, they're disagreement. Yes. Right. And then, you know, like a lot of times, like I, I might have let that go or whatever, let them deal with it, or or maybe I didn't even really notice. It was really the biggest problem. But then if you let that happen though, then when you leave the room as the entrepreneur or the, the business owner, they're going to talk to this next person. Exactly. And then the next person, then cancer. they're going to go have lunch. Yep. And then they're going to talk about that. And it's what it really comes down to, and this is what I was trying to articulate to the team, is like, folks, that that is a human negative characteristic mm-hmm. to be an individual and and disagree with something. The skeptic. I the, love the skeptic. Yes. The skeptic. The, the cynical skeptic. And it's like, man, but they don't real they don't even realize what they're doing. But I was like, you you have this negativity. You don't talk to me, right. the person that can actually give you clarity about the circumstance yes, yes. and why decisions might right, be being right. made. No, you're right. And then and then they talk to other people and then they brew this up. And the next thing you know, you're dealt you're dealing with a massive issue. You know, and all the energy sucked out of the company. Matt, Matt Lewis says that he calls that the meeting after the meeting. Mm. Because you got to watch the meeting after the meeting. Uh, and whoever's yeah. holding that, <laughs> you, you, yeah. need, you need to you need to work on your on that person. Yeah, you go grab them, pull them in, okay. or whatever. Yeah, right? because that it's so true. Um, it, I but I was, I was like telling them, I'm not, I'm wanting to put some of this onus, all of the onus, really, back on the team. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I have, you know, I've admitted to him, like, I have a job. I'm like, I, y'all think, and I specifically said this, I think, if y'all think that I wake up every morning smelling flowers and seeing rainbows, you're absolutely <laughs> freaking wrong. Like, I mean, I have my own negative shit, sure. right? You know, I wake up and I have fears and I have concerns and anxieties and stuff right. like that, you know, and detriments and dooms. Yeah. I was like, but my job is, is to get myself out of the bed, work through that crap. <laughs> You know, get in here and start making it happen. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. Like get on the other side, get to yes. the light, you yes. know? And yes. I was like, but if, you know, if, if y'all don't do that, like, I mean, I can't do that for you. Yeah. I can't wake up every morning and think about, you know, 10, 20, if, you know, 100 people that I have to make sure that they're seeing positive light every day, you know? It's so true. I tell you. And I was like, can we? So relevant. My, my big stand up speech was, can we be that company? that doesn't tolerate that negative toxicity. Yes. And we're so aware individually that we don't bring that to the company on right. a daily basis. And when you see a peer that's behaving that way, that you don't engage with that and you reject that. Yes. Can we be that gosh dang company? Because that's like so the right. secret freaking sauce, man. I'm telling you, it's so true. It's it the is. secret sauce. You can overcome anything. You, you can. That attitude. And all the company is is just a you know is, is a group of people working together on the same goal. Who believe? Yes, believe. Yeah, they gotta believe, baby. They gotta believe, man. I know it's so true. I, I we could talk about this all day. 
But <laughs> we're supposed to talk about some other stuff. Yes, we are. Um, so do you have anything that you wanted to talk about um, as it relates to the history of entrepreneurship today? I don't. No? Mark, I failed again. That's all right. There's no problem. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you for the relief. We'll let you off the, the, the uh, hook on that. Let's see what this is. But we have the swag hat. We got this, and you're not wearing it today. No, like I'm you, not. You, you did I did that see well. that show, though, and I was like, man, I yeah, like that hat. I know. You look good in it. Thank you. Okay, the word for today from the Swag Hat is disruptive. Ooh, I like that. What do you think about that? I love that word. Everybody's a disruptor, though, on LinkedIn now. You know, oh, their hell profiles. Yeah. They're all disruptors. Yeah. It's, I've I mean, seen it's, a lot of those, like these little taglines about who you are and you're disrupting. And you can't put the, oh, the same question in the okay. Swag Hat, man. We'll re Just, read that again next week or something. I, what is it again? It's disruptive. Disruptive. <laughs> <laughs> You're not being disruptive. But I mean, yeah, yeah. like the, um, you know, I think that disruptors don't really talk about disrupting because disrupting is actually a really excellent strategy in business. Yeah, it is. You know what I'm saying? If you can, if you can, you've got to do the go the opposite way sometimes. Yeah, it, 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 you know, you can't just do what everybody else does. That's what I always hate about that term, best practices. Mm. Best practices implies I'm going to do things like everybody else. Yeah, that's not the way to be successful in business. No, it's not. It's okay. not. You have to be disruptive, right? Yeah. I mean, like, it, especially with today's times, with all the technology advances. I mean, the AI come coming full bore. I mean, like, you got to. How do you use and leverage all these new tools and be a disruptor in whatever industry you're in? Honestly, like I'm not getting on the AI kick, but that's what the AI environment is going to be able to do for a lot of new entrepreneurs. They're going to be able to leverage that technology and disrupt a lot. I mean, really, it applies to any industry on the planet. Yeah, well, it's sort of like the internet, how it gave everybody yeah. an advantage that they didn't used to have. Like the small guys got access to the worldwide yeah. market, basically. Yep. Right. Yep. It's the same thing with the AI. It's like now you can do stuff that big companies could only do with very little developmental cost. Not yeah. that I'm any expert in AI, but I mean, well, they're predicting that that if you know the disruptors that are leveraging the AI, mm -hmm. I mean, you can have billion dollar companies with ten or less employees on team. Yeah, it's pretty wild. It is wild. And there's what, going to be a lot of that. Was it on this show or was it somewhere else that somebody was talking to us about how they had to negotiate a, a purchasing agreement with AI? That AI was actually negotiating. Oh, are you serious? The company. No, I, I didn't. It wasn't on this show. Uh -uh. Yeah, it was, somebody was telling me that recently that they had to negotiate with AI. Wow. Okay. That's pretty crazy. Isn't yeah. that crazy? It is crazy. So the buyer was just completely taken out of the picture. <laughs> yeah. You know, which no, is just a negotiating. big job. Yeah. Normally, right? yeah. 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 Anyway. Huh. Yeah, it is going to be disruptive. I, I think, you know, the whole thing with disruption, though, I mean, it can. The problem is when people think they're being disruptors inside the company and mm. they're the cynics mm. and the naysayers that we were talking about. That's a negative That's side of disruption. That's not a good kind of disruption. It's not. You okay. know, and I mean, here's the reality. If you're disrupting the company, you're really hurting your peers yeah. more than you are the, you know, the, the folks that are at the top of the company or whatever, right? I mean, in most circumstances, you can see that. Well, sometimes you got to be a disruptor, but it's hard to be an internal disruptor and not be perceived as negative yeah. and not on the team. Yeah. I mean, it really is. Yeah, and you, and if it, it also depends on what you're disrupting and how you know right. why you're disrupting whatever it is that you're disrupting. You know, I mean, yeah, you know, a lot of times, folks, if they put that energy towards how can we have this company and and disrupt the industry? Yeah, that's what we want. We that's want to disrupt want. the industry. We want yeah. to disrupt the market. Yeah, we want to disrupt our competitors, not disrupt the company. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we figured that out. You know? Well, it is true though. You know, you gotta you gotta do things differently. I mean, 
Most of us are working in industries. Most small businesses are in mature industries yeah. where there's lots and lots of players. Mm -hmm. Rarely are they the pioneer out there with something all new. Right. So you've got to differentiate yourself yep. in order to break through the pack. Which means you have to disrupt something. You got to disrupt something. And the cool thing is there's a lot of little things you can disrupt to give you that cutting edge mm -hmm. in the business, whether it's, you know, it's customer service. It's actually project management, which would be a fantastic disruptor in a lot of industries. You know, like good communication. I don't think it's really understood. I, I no. the way P, project management is taught and people are trained, mm. I, I, I think they go way off course. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It, it needs to be more on the, as you said, the communication and the human interaction aspects versus per charts and CPM logic networks and full wall schedules. Agreed. You know, and that's usually what's emphasized. Yeah. And it's, I don't think it's lifted high enough within the org, or it doesn't have the esteem that it needs to have. It, it doesn't because a lot of companies are make classic matrix organizations mm. where there are functional departments mm. and the PM sits outside of that and they have to go to these departments to get their team and the team doesn't report to them permanently. Mm. Their real boss is their department head or, or functional head. Gotcha, yeah. And the PM is just using that talent and that's why they don't have the clout they need. So how would you set it up differently then? I like having I like having PMs inside the functional areas. And so mm. they at least whatever is the most primary function of the job is where the PM resides. So at least they have some control over some of the resources on a permanently assigned basis. So they're basically in in that specific department. You have a PM per department is what you're saying. Right. You got PMs in the departments and so if the job takes 60% of whatever this function is, that's where the PM is going to reside. They get the 40 from the other ones, but at least they got some mm -hmm. control mm -hmm. over some resources mm -hmm. as opposed to really having no control. Yeah. When they sit outside completely. Yeah. Just off on their own. They have, they just ladder up to a head of customer success or something yes, like that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a big, the organization structure plays a really big part in that. Most people think it's, it's not important, but it really is. But, yeah. But you're right that when you start talking about project management, I think, you know, some of the stuff that really makes people great project managers is, is really pretty simple stuff. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. really is. Yeah. It's, it's like, just consistency. It is. It's it's consistency of communication. Prioritization. Documentation of everything. Prior setting the priorities. Mm -hmm. Communicating to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It's and and you know, it's we can talk about that. We should make that a future episode. We really should. And but I mean on the disruption, I mean, but like a company can disrupt in any of those little small nuances. So I think that, you know, what I don't want to hopefully that listeners don't come, you know, take out of it is, is that you have to have a business that is specifically dedicated to disrupting an industry. No. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Right. You can go into a mature industry yes. with a very specific thing that you're disrupting in, yeah. whether it's the customer service, right. Or it's the pricing. It's, it could be a lot of different things, but you can disrupt in many ways and you can always disrupt. So once you disrupt that angle, you can go disrupt another angle. Exactly. Keep the cutting and you edge. probably need to because yeah. one thing isn't going to be enough. No. no. Everybody else will figure that out. Yeah. So you've got to be constantly mm -hmm. disrupting. Yep. It, it's 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 really true. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things we're going to talk about today, speaking of disruption, mm -hmm. I don't know what the relevance is to the topic, but maybe there is. Well, I mean, pricing. pricing. Pricing can be disruptive. Pricing can be disruptive. I think, you know, I've again, I've seen so many small businesses. My students do these reports every semester on a small business, a consulting project. Mm. And if you go back over 20 years, Eric, I bet you I've seen well over a thousand companies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the financials on most of those. And if there is a common theme when it comes to pricing, Small businesses don't charge enough. Yeah. Because what they can do is provide better service than a megacorp. It's true. Okay. Yep. And they got to get paid for that. Yep. And they're not going to have the volume. They're not going to have the cost competitiveness. Right. 
they, you know, they don't have the resources, but what they do have is the ability to give extra high quality service. Yeah. And that can command a premium in the price. Absolutely. And if you don't have that, then there's just so many small businesses that are just underpricing what they do. You know, and I think that, uh, I think part of that might be just the, the lack of realization of how important, but also how complex pricing strategy really is. Like, I, and I don't think it's a, you know, you, you set it and then you just kind of forget it and then oh, you just no. keep working. Like you're constantly got to be thinking about that and how do you move it? And I mean, what's working, right? Well, sometimes just having a high price actually creates a perception of higher quality. Absolutely. But, you know, so I've always, most of my career, not, not all of it, obviously, I worked in the professional service industry. And there, you know, the higher pricing allows you to do a better job. You can have better people, mm -hmm. you can have better marketing, you can have more investment in your systems, all that. So the pricing is super, super critical. Yeah. The only way you're going to command that is by being specialized and by being perceived as really good, right? Yep. But I'll tell you what, coming out of the main and the manufacturing side, mm. working in the motorcycle company, mm -hmm. we I, I've gotten a whole new education on how elastic mm. some things are. Yeah. Some things now, like our bikes are expensive for what yeah. they are, right? Yeah. They're at the high end uh, of their category. We can look and see when we have price reductions, the demand goes up significantly hmm. so that business is completely different it's so much more price sensitive yeah than some of the other businesses that i've been a part of yeah that it's a real education for me i think every industry and company is different in a way yeah it feels like that that has a lot to do with like you know what sector are you in the b2c market versus the b2b market right exactly b2c i think it's a lot more critical very price sensitive yes b2b is not as right. critical yep i think that's a very good point because i think you know when i think about that the b2b side is a lot of times the, the buyers within the business for a service or a product mm -hmm. are really looking for more they, they recognize respect and need more of that attention Right. Or that service component to it. Like, yeah, are you going to, to are you going to actually do what you say you're going to do? Yes, because so many other things depend on it. Absolutely. That's why. And they're, and they're looking, you know, I mean, if they're looking at their job going, if I screw yep. this up, if I make a bad procurement decision on this. Yep. Then um, then this is going to be painful the whole way around. And plus, I'm going to look like an idiot. Yep. And it's going to affect my job. Whereas on a personal side, it's just like, well, I mean, do should I spend this? And am I going to get in trouble? you know, with the spouse or yeah. am I going right. to wreck my finances or whatever it might be? And so you have to yes. be really price sensitive on that. And that's really the most important thing. Yes. Yes, it is. I think too, like a lot of people don't understand, like in the manufacturing business, you know, I think we are very, very concerned about our margin. All right. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the fallacy in that is that it, if you don't have enough volume, you don't spread your overhead out right. on, a, on a per unit basis. And so you're, you're not making the margin you think you are. Right. Okay. Yeah. Maybe there's a margin on your labor and your raw cost to make your product. All yeah. right. Yeah. That can look great. But if you don't do that enough, you know, if I, if I triple my volume, mm -hmm. my overhead goes down by two thirds, my overhead right. allocation. Once I hit break even, I mean, think about that. Hmm. And so that's that's where having volume can really make a big difference over, which means how am I going to drive volume? Well, if it's a B to C business, like you said, that's in a price sensitive market, I got to drop my price. Yeah. It's a complex thing. It is. It's not that simple. But, you know, I think back this this is big talk about small business. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I have seen so many instances where the price does need to go up. I mean, I'll never forget. I had this student who did their project on a pizza buffet restaurant mm -hmm. where the owner had two of them. And the 
one of the most profound recommendations of my student was raise all your soft drink prices by 10 cents and you make $26,000 a year more profit. The guy was taking 200 and something thousand a year out. Wow. But all he had to do, this student went and said, okay, who are your competitors? <laughs> and it was like four or five other places, mm -hmm. you know, they're in a major metro area. So they went and checked the soft drink prices of all them. Oh. And these guys were the lowest. They were like a dollar eighty nine and they ranged like from a low of like dollar ninety nine to two thirty nine. Mm -hmm. And based on the number of soft drinks they sold over the course of a year, two hundred and sixty thousand. God. Ten cent increase turn, translates to twenty six thousand. That's awesome. And nobody's gonna say no. I mean, a 20 cent increase. My only thought on that is maybe you should have gone 20 cents. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Then you'd make 52,000 yeah. more. Yeah, that's exactly what I was sitting here thinking. That one simple thing. Are people going to come in there and go, $1.89 for my Coke? No, they're God bless. You know, they're used to that. Or $1.99. Last week it was $1.89. <laughs> right. They don't know. No, no. Okay. They don't know what it costs. That's awesome, though, because you took something that was already there. I mean, it, it didn't add any expense to you whatsoever, either. It, it's, that's where I think so many companies, like another small business. I used to live in, in the dover Sherburn area of Boston, mm -hmm. which is a very, very affluent rural community. It's right 16 miles from Boston Harbor. It's right next to Wellesley, you know, which is one of the W towns in the Boston area. Those mm -hmm. are the affluent. Dover Sherburn, super affluent. Okay. The average, you know, income there 20 years ago was probably 250K a year. Yeah. And there was one place in town that you could buy food to go. All right. And it was really good. This guy had this, this place inside the Sitco station, which was the hub of all activity in Dover Sherburn. Mm -hmm. They had a Dunkin' Donuts drive-up window on the side. Nice. You could get your dry cleaning done there. You could rent your videos there. You bought your gas there. And they had this Italian takeout. And so this guy, he owned this, and he did okay with it. Yeah. Because I saw his numbers. Um, I had a friend of mine who was a local BMW sales guy, and he told me how much money this guy was taking out of his business. He'd seen all of his tax returns. <laughs> And and anyway, so he's selling these sandwiches for like three fifty, and these meals for like six or seven bucks. Mm -hmm. All right, and people are friggin' lined up. They, it, it, you know, at the end of the day, they're coming home. They're tired. Yeah, they don't want to make dinner. No, they go over. I mean, they get the food there. It's fantastic. All right, yeah. this is not like the hot dogs in the roller kind of place. This right. is completely separate. It's really freaking good. The line is out the door. And I said to this guy, dude, you should raise all your prices. You got this rich bunch of customers. There's no way they would complain if your sandwiches went from three fifty to four fifty. No, yeah. And your meals went up by two bucks and you would double your freaking income. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's like, I don't want to do that. I, I want to keep it affordable. Uh yeah. I'm like, dude. You don't understand your target audience. We're not coming here because it's cheap. <laughs> We're coming here because it's good and it's the only thing in town. And it's convenient. It's convenient. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand why people are buying what they buy from you mm -hmm. and price it accordingly. Yeah. Very good point. Very I mean, good point. He could have doubled his income. Yeah. I, I'm not exaggerating with no problem in one year. Yeah. And not and not lost any business. No, nope. people go on. I mean, a lot of times people might be discontented with that change in the immediate, but they, you know, as long as it's not absurd, right? You know, I mean, they'll get used to it and go on. Then you can raise it again another two years on the road. He had a superior product. He was in the right location with the customer base that could afford it. Mm -hmm. You've got to understand your customers, and you've got to understand why people are buying from you. Yeah. And to come up with an appropriate pricing strategy. And so on that note, like, I mean, because one of my questions I was going to ask you is like for the new entrepreneur that's thinking about starting a business, like mm -hmm. where do you even start with pricing? You know I mean? Like how do you even get to a price level? I'm going to start high. I okay. think you need to start higher than you think. 
Okay. You can always go down, but you can't go back up easily. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is very difficult to do. Mm-hmm. So it's easier to start off high yeah. and test demand. I always felt like, again, going back to my own experience, I was going to be expensive and so maybe I'm not working all the time, but when I do work, I get paid well for it. And the right. rest of my time I can spend devoted to my actual business yeah. to make it better. Mm-hmm. So we're better able to service these clients mm-hmm. as opposed to I work all the time. It's cheap. I'm super busy and I have no time to devote to my business. Yeah, That's the trap that the average small business owner falls into, mm. mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. But again, back on pricing and, and not charging enough. So, you know, last night my wife was out with some of her friends who just came in town for dinner. And I got my 13-year-old daughter and, you know, I go before, she and I are going to go out to dinner. So before I go out, I got to feed the critters, okay? Yeah. You know, we got these two giant Great Pyrenees, which can Do like, you really? Oh, yeah. One weighs 160 and one 110. God. I mean, it, 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 the one is like a, it's like having farm animals in your house. Yeah. They I think inside dogs the too? Huh? They're they, inside. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Totally inside. If my cleaners don't come every week, there's going to be like dust bunnies the size of this hat rolling through that house, dude. <laughs> because of the shedding. But anyway, and then we got one cat. We used to have four. Oh, God. One time. We got one cat. So I go to feed the cat and we're out of canned cat food. Of course, uh-huh. it gets, it's got its dry, but it's got to have its canned or it's going to yell at you all night long. <laughs> Normally, we buy this stuff at Walmart neighborhood market yeah. in like 24 things at a time. It's dirt cheap, right? Yeah. I don't know what it costs us three bucks, four, or uh, 30, 40 cents a can, yeah. basically. Yeah. Okay. So I go, well, let's just go to Ozark Natural Foods. It's convenient. You know, Hazel and I were driving home. I'm like, I got to get some of this food. Yeah. We stop over there. We go in Ozark Natural Foods. You know what it costs for a can, a small can of cat food at Ozark Natural Foods? The cheapest ones, $1.39. I had to hunt for that. The normal ones that are at eye level are a buck ninety nine a can. Dang. For a small can. Okay. And now how can they get that? Yeah. When they can buy it for 30 cents at Walmart. Right. Right. Because they understand their market. They're sitting right there in town where the truly the most affluent people live. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not the ones that are showing off the most that live in the suburban 8,000 square foot drywall palaces. These right. are the people who actually have money that are living in town in a 3,000 square foot, 100 year old house. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They know they got the market there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They got the location. They got the customer base. And they're saying, we don't need to give this stuff away. No. This is what's convenient. They're going to pay it. And the customer also is the kind that appreciate higher quality type of ingredients. They have, Yeah. I don't know whether have, there's anything have better a, in their food or not. Well, but, I mean, there apparently is, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so they're, they're it's not a familiar brand. I'll say that. No, it's organic. It's natural. You know, it doesn't have all these other things in it that could be harming their pets. Yes. They love their pets. And so, but that's also understanding your market. Exactly. Because it's, you know, I mean, like I've been in those places too, and you might have a lot of the high income earners, but you also have a lot of folks that are identifying with that, that may not be making much money at all, but they're investing in that, that identity, that belief. Yeah, that it's a co-op. It supports local yeah. businesses. Absolutely. Yada, yeah. yada, yada. Natural yeah. foods take care of it. Yes. Save the planet. I mean, yeah. but I mean, that's knowing yeah. who your audience is. Yes. You know, yes. and being able to. to and to understanding why they buy. Yes. Why they come to you. Yep. Yep. So, yeah. So the, the complexities, though, of pricing, though, as you get into the business, mm-hmm. you know, and I think we hit on a little bit about adjusting, like you're talking about those stories. But. You know, I've I've oft, I've also dealt with like pricing strategists in businesses. You know that consult. Well, on you've that. dealt on a big high level where you're dealing mm-hmm. with like millions and millions of dollars worth of consumer products, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's just like a completely different level where there's got to be a lot more science. There's a lot more numbers. Yeah, and I think that it's uh, you know, but I think you know one of the things about that is that like if you start out, if you have a pricing plan, and you're you're thinking about starting a business. You know, do some competitive analysis. You know, what's yeah. other? What are the com- competition charging? Then, how are you going to disrupt that with your pricing? You can set the same type of pricing, maybe, or a little bit higher, mm-hmm. but you're offering a little bit higher quality service. You have that angle to it, 
But then as you start building that business, you know, you have to be very conscious of, you know, how are you moving your pricing? You know, how are you adjusting that based upon the circumstances? You know, because it's not a one time decision. No, that's right. You're right. Yes. You know, I think that's a very good point. And I think the mac, the, there's macroeconomics that affect it. There's, mm -hmm. you know, microeconomics that are affecting that. There's, you yeah. know, the value propositions. I mean, all that type of stuff. Competition so, changes in the marketplace. Technology changes. Yeah. You know, one of my things on that is like what we're trying to do here and, and you know, the other companies is, is, you know, we talked about AI a little bit earlier, but, you know, how do we use technology to keep you know, to be able to do more, mm -hmm. you know, in less time, because our, our business, everything's about time. Sure. Right? And so if we can it's any service business, that's all yeah. you got. And if you can, but yeah. if you can use the tech, if you can get in that mm -hmm. vein, then you can actually do more with that. And that helps you hold your price. So there's another strategy to it, right? Like if you're $150 an hour versus $150 an hour in the market, right? And so you're in line but other people are having to raise their price because they're not leveraging the efficiencies of technology or processes. Right. But you can hold your price and well, provide the same or better. Yeah. I mean, and then over time, you're probably going to get even more advantage of it, right? Because absolutely. you're, you're into the technology earlier. And if you continue to invest in it, yeah, you're going to always be ahead. Yep. Yep. Of, and, of the other guy. Yeah. And, and, and you can, and then you, your time per, you know, your, your amount per hour is actually becoming more profitable. Yeah. You know, where you as long as your pricing schedule is on a fixed price, right. if you charge by the hour and now you have less hours to charge that, that so defeats the purpose. That's a really good point. I'm okay. a, I'm a big personally, uh, in my experience, I'm a really, really big fan of, of more project or like project-based pricing, I guess you would say. Like, mm -hmm. I will do this. I already know the amount of hours it takes me. And so right. I'm going to charge you $500 flat to do this project, execute it correctly. And it rewards you. your efficiency. Exactly. Yeah. It challenges us. It makes us where we're... And then, then the customer knows what I'm charging. Then you're just aligning to expectations. Yes. I'm not sending... I'm, not, I'm also not burdening the team with timesheets all the time. I know. You know what I'm saying? I come out of the professional service world again where so many people don't understand that. They just charge by hour? Yeah, they're still trying to charge by hour. So every time they invest in technology, it basically actually comes back to bite them in the rear. Mm -hmm. They become less billable. Yeah. <laughs> they make less money. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't make any sense at all. No, that's true. You've got to be on fixed price. It's also burdensome. And I think on the customer. You're right about the, that timesheet, too. Yeah. And the, I think on the and client, the, it's always overhead. this mystery. It's like, like, I'm always worried about how I, much time are you freaking spending, Mark? I know. Like, it makes me anxious as a as the person that the, the Right. The and then you got to watch over them. And then you yeah. see somebody that's on their job that's not working. <laughs> and they're and smoking. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's chilling and you're pulling up and it's like, what the hell? I'm yes. like, and then in your mind, you're like, am I really paying, you know, there's 150 bucks for this? And then you leave and I then know. you're just discontented and yes. then you probably won't use them again. It's so true. You know, and I've, I've, I've had some People experience. need to think about this stuff. They really do. They really do. It's so many small business owners that they just follow convention. Yes. Like, this is the way it was done at the last place I worked. So I'm just going to keep doing the same thing. And that's, that comes back to that whole disruption mentality, right? Like, I mean, we yeah. talked about the construction. It's just an easy one for everybody to kind of get a little bit, right? But, I mean, you know, if I was in the business, I would just be charging project-based fees. You know, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to do the job for this. I'm going to get it done right for that. If I can be more efficient in my job, mm -hmm. you know, then I'm going to do that. If I can leverage things or, if I, or whatever, if I can negotiate my, con my subcontractors to right. do it for a certain price and I got it everything's fixed out. Yeah. And then I'm not not sitting here <laughs> saying, oh, I think it's going to be 30 hours. Yeah. And then, oh, by the way, when I sent you the final bill, it was 55 hours. Right. And there's nothing you can do about it. Then. I, I, and you lose so your true. repeat business. But, but I was thinking the other day, um, so I had my landscapers out there, I don't know, it was maybe a month ago, doing the second pass on the leaves. Now we need them for the third pass because they just keep freaking falling. Right. I got this yeah, big yeah. yard, you know, and you don't like having leaves on the ground. No. Yeah. And it's so you're going to do house, three passes. It's completely covered right now. I got to have them come back, but there's still some up there 
And Sonia's like, no, wait, wait. Yeah, they, you know, but you can't handle that. But but anyway, my point is this. He charges, the guy's a great guy, charges a set price per day for his guys to come yeah. and work, okay? But so the last time he was there, I was out there watching him. Well, they got this machine, yeah. all right, that chops up the leaves. Uh -huh. They just shove them into this machine. It chops them up and it blows them into the back of a truck. And it yeah. so. It's very compact that way, right? Mm -hmm. They can haul a lot more out. Less hauls using fuel. Exactly. And he was telling me, you know, I bought this machine and, you know, it saves us so much time and everything. But all I could think about was, that's great for me. Yeah. But for you, your hourly or your day rate is the same. Yeah. Whether it might have taken you two days at 1200 bucks a day. Yeah. Now you can do it in one day. For twelve hundred bucks, in a way, you cut your own throat. Hmm. How's okay? that? Okay. How's that? Why? Because he's not getting paid any more per day. Gotcha. He's not getting paid any more per day. My last guys would have charged me. You know, they didn't have that machine. They stacked them in the trailer and take like six guys standing in the trailer, pushing the leaves <laughs> yeah. down. Like, you see what I mean? Yeah. It's almost like they were rewarded for their inefficiency. Mm. And now it's the greater efficiency. Because they would take them two days to do the job that these other folks are doing. Right. One what day. they should say is, I'll do it for 1500 bucks now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now because I have this machine and the other guy is going to charge you two days, it's going to cost 2400 bucks. I can do it one day for 1500 or 1800 mm -hmm. And then the technology actually rewards me for making this big investment in this truck and this trailer mounted thing and freaking who knows? I bet you that trailer thing costs at least 50 grand that oh, chops yeah. them up and blows it. Oh yeah. Okay. And you could kill yourself with that processing strategy if you're not really careful about that. Just yeah. like you said. Yeah. So you just do more work and get paid the same amount of money and you've got the <sighs> overhead of the equipment. But I, I think yeah. that's not that uncommon. No, no. I mean, that's a sneaky thing. That's a really sneaky thing. That's and, uh, the way it, early on when, when the architecture and engineering industry started using CAD. Yeah. That was the problem there because they're charging by the hour Yeah, for this talent. Now we've got this CAD that multiplies their effectiveness, computer aided design, but we're still getting paid the same thing. But now we're paying a million dollars for our intergraph CAD system mm -hmm. with a VAX and all the men, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just made less money. That's all we did. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well have an army of guys out there drawing ink on linen. Yeah. Yeah. And if we had a fixed price strategy, mm -hmm. that would have been another matter to start out with. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, I agree. Anyway, the pricing thing, it is one of the four P's of the marketing mix. True. And I think it's ignored yep. by too many companies. They just keep working on, on promotion. Mm -hmm. Maybe they refine the product, mm -hmm. but they're not really thinking about pricing the way they should. Yeah. And I think, if again, you know, with a lot of small businesses, I always say, look at how the consumer product companies do things. Mm -hmm. They make billions of dollars. There's a lot of science behind what they do. Can you learn from them? Mm -hmm. You know, like advertising, I always say, look at the consumer product companies. Yeah. Yeah. They know what they're doing. They're the best. Right? Yeah. They know what they're doing. Yep. The, you know, commercials aren't a minute long any longer because they don't need to be. They can be 15 seconds long. Yep. Okay. They know that's better. Yeah. It, it, whatever it is, mm -hmm. they, they, they've refined their packaging design. They've refined their pricing strategies. Follow them. It's true. How? What can you learn from them? They got armies of scientists working on this stuff. They really do. They have, yeah, people that are like, I've worked with a lot of those folks. I and, know you've and, had experience with them. I mean, I they're some of the smartest people that I've ever met. Exactly. I mean, all around, sure. all of the companies. Yeah, I believe it. I mean, Big it's brands. I guess that, you know, now you point that out, working with that for, for the, the length of time that I have and then seeing some of the others in, outside of this, the CPG realm or the brands mm -hmm. and the products, it's just like, I mean, the inefficiencies, the lack of, of really investing in research, thought processes, strategy, all that type of stuff. And then action, yep. you know, and then follow-ups. Yeah. I mean, 
you know, what the thing is when you work with one of those companies, like you've got to be on your A game, hundred percent right. on your A game. There's you know, a lot of money riding on every decision. They absolutely. Make. There's a lot of money. And the other thing they do well is they experiment. They do. They test things out to see if they work. You know, one thing that I've found that they do excellently well as well is, is, that, is that they... Excellently well. I wonder if that's a word. As well. <laughs> oh, excellently as that. well. Yes. I said excellently that as makes, well as well. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of makes sense, right? But what they do excellently, mm -hmm. Mark, is if you, do a, if you do business with them, they monitor and manage you as the as the contractor, like with with superb skill. Mm -hmm. Like they don't let you project management manage their job with you. They project manage your job with them. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the greatest lessons. Right? Is like they they will make sure they are holding you accountable to what you said day one. Right, and then they're following you through on every single t meeting that they have. And they're waiting for the recap notes. Boy, that's tough, isn't dude. It, it is. That, I mean, it's a high standard. It's a high standard of, high standard of accountability. It really is, yeah. but it's a great. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a great lesson. I mean, and and that's what makes them so great, though. Yeah. In all honesty, they're yeah. all trained that way. They're all thinking that way. Well, all I know is that there's so many opportunities out there. There are. It, it, you know, it, it just every day I wake up and I'm like, holy cow. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some people out there who are super negative. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you know, the world's turning to shit. Yeah. Whatever. Dude, I don't okay. see it that way, man. It, it, and then there's other people who yeah. are out there who go, you know what? All the change, the turmoil, the confusion creates all an opportunity. opportunity. It's all opportunity. That's man. the entrepreneurial mindset. It is, man. That's how entrepreneurs win. That's how they've always won. That's how they'll continue to win. You know, yeah. I think that we just have the ability in today's world to hear so many different voices. The voices now are loud and clear, you know, about the negative side or about yeah. the worries and the fears. And, we yeah. all, and everybody feeds off that. But that's kind of like going back to what I was telling my team is like, guys, like if we can mm -hmm. imagine if everybody that walks in this door, like we've done our own self, you know, growth in the in the light and positivity when you walk in the door and then you bring that to your clientele i mean it's going to reward you a hundredfold no kidding a hundredfold yeah you're, then you're a positive force for them then exactly. you're an energizing uh you know leader of them yes yeah it's a great thing man yeah you're right you don't need that much capital you just need that much energy and positivity yeah, yeah well the energy is in a way capital Title, it's more, I think it's more precious. Than that. Yeah. That's what I'm starting to discover. Yeah. You know, you can yeah. do a lot when you have a lot of energy. Yeah, you're right. Routine. Well, speaking of energy, we need to end this show. We do. It's all over. Unfortunately. Sad thing, man. It is. We, we, we have to say goodbye until another time. Um, we're always interested in your feedback. Love the questions. Listeners, love the questions. Send us questions. There's a topic you want us to talk about. We love yeah. that. Yeah. Um, we're always looking for sponsors. Anybody who wants to, has a product or service of value to small businesses, mm -hmm. reach out to us. We'd love to take a look at it. If we think it's something that's valuable, we'd be glad to promote it. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. We're not going to promote it if we don't think it's valuable. That's true. And, uh, and it, we're here to, to help and we're here to give guidance and we're here to help you keep your heads on straight, there small you go. business owners. Right? Because we need help with that. You right. help me keep my head on straight, Mark. Well, you help me keep mine on straight. Thanks, buddy. All right, everybody. Well, until next week, this has been another episode of Big, Big Talk, Talk About, about Small business. business. Have a good day. You too. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Big Talk About Small Business. If you have any questions or ideas for upcoming shows, be sure to head over to our website, www.bigtalkaboutsmallbusiness.com and click on the Ask the Host button for the chance to have your questions answered on the show. Stay connected with us on LinkedIn at Big Talk About Small Business. 
And be sure to head over to our website to read articles, browse episodes, and ask questions about upcoming shows. 